accepting what's coming our way. So this weekend's resto is undoubtedly full of kids. It's going to be too crazy. We were going to try to pull one off on Thursday. That also is not going to work. We have too much crew to come in tomorrow afternoon. Okay? So what we're going to tell you is you don't have to come by my room anymore to sign up for restos that we don't know when they're going to happen. So sit tight and relax. If the weather carries on like this for a few weeks, we're obviously not going to penalize you for coming. So relax. If we get breaks in the weather, then we're going to accelerate and do a few more after school. Because some of you realize we have $2,500 worth of plants in Mr. Martinez's backyard. <laughs> okay? You would not believe what is hidden in the backyard. And we need those things planted. So planning Saturday will be off, December 1st, for those of you who are going to do it. We're hoping to do it on the 8th, but if you look at the long-range forecast, we're supposed to get a break Monday, Tuesday, and then this is supposed to start again next week. Wednesday, two days later, so we'll see what you have. That's always expected. So, thank you for taking care of at least getting less two hours done. I think you're going to enjoy this one. First off, turned off. I don't want to have to throw my cane at you when yours goes off in front of everybody. It's embarrassing. Phones off. Excuse me. You don't need to start talking. None of you have a voice activated phone. So quiet. We can keep going because we're already 10-15 minutes Okay, anything else before I start intros? Yeah, guys, you read your emails. They're getting sent out. You got to follow that. We, we have no other way. I don't Facebook. So that didn't happen. So read your emails. Okay, well, I'm, I have a unique pleasure today that I get to introduce who is probably my best friend right now. <laughs> but we have been together, this man and I, for a long time now, about 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> you silly dream. Yeah, I first met Rodney almost 22 years ago. Our sons were born a day apart from each other. introduce to you uh, Rodney Fricke, who is a groundwater geologist with Aerojet. He got his bachelor's in geology from Southern Illinois University. You won't say how many years ago he did that. <laughs> he then went on to University of Nevada, Reno, UNR, to get his master's in geology in groundwater. Went to the Bay Area and worked as a consultant for a number of years for private firms and then um, took a job with Aerojet as one of their groundwater remediation specialists. Okay. So what he's going to talk to you about today is a little history of Aerojet because a lot of you don't really realize what Aerojet has done for this country and we wouldn't have been on the moon without Aerojet. And so he's going to talk a bit about that, but that process <laughs> caused a lot of pollution. And some of you are in Rancho Cordova and Folsom area. So he's going to be showing you maps and talking about the groundwater issues that are in the southern part of this country. Okay? So I present to you Rodney Frick. Are you Dean or Mr. K? Okay, well, thank you, Mr. K. Um, I am Rodney Fricke, and um, I will be talking for about an hour now. Uh, maybe a little longer. I have 115 slides. They will go really fast, so um, you'll need to uh, pay attention, I suppose. Um, so here's my, my presentation content. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about who I am, a little bit more about what Aerojet does. Not a lot of the history of Aerojet, but what, what, what some of our current products are. We'll talk about um, groundwater flow, 
contamination at Aerojet. Uh, then we'll talk about the big picture as far as groundwater remediation. We call, call that uh, groundwater extraction and treatment, or GETS. Um, we have a lot of GETS, and, um, and we'll, we'll go through those. And then most of the, the talk, probably half of it, we'll talk about bioremediation because that um, is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, we're, we're hoping that that's a, a better way to go, but, but sometimes we're not sure. <laughs> anyway, and then there's time for questions at the end. I also brought uh, a little aquarium groundwater model. Uh, if you want to stay afterwards, we can play around with uh, red or green food coloring and, and make our own plumes and clean them up. I brought some uh, examples of the uh, materials and tool uh, and a drill bit that, that we, uh, we don't really use that small of a drill bit, but uh, it's easy to pick up. So um, anyway, I'm an uh, environmental specialist at Aerojet. I've been there uh, over 23 years, and I'm a registered geologist and a certified uh, hydrogeologist in California, the 11th one, actually. And only because I got up early in the morning, I could get my registration and I showed up at the office so I could get number one, but I was the 11th in line. Anyway, Aerojet, we're a 70-year-old company. We started in Southern California. We moved to uh, um, Sacramento area, Rancho Cordova in uh, 1952, and so we've been around here 60 years. Uh, we make solid and liquid rocket propulsion systems, solid rocket motors, liquid rocket engines, and they come in different sizes, and I'll show you examples of them. Uh, we have offices all over the country, uh, and that includes uh, manufacturing facilities as well as uh, just field offices for clients or uh, government uh, agencies. And uh, we are currently in the process of merging with Rocketdyne, uh, and they're based in um, Southern California and throughout the, the country as well, and so that'll probably double our, our uh, size of our company. We do offer summer internships for upper division college students. Um, and it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You can be an accountant. Uh, you can be uh, a regular engineer for uh, you know, facilities type because we have, uh, I think, 1,800 people maybe at Aerojet in Sacramento, 2,400 across the nation. But you know, we need uh, a lot of different hats to keep that place running. And uh, you know, a fair amount of them are rocket engineers, rocket scientists, but, but a lot of them uh, are just uh, ordinary people like me. So anyway, Aerojet, um, we make very large solid rocket engines that lift things off the ground. You can't see the label, but this would be a space lift engine, AJ-26. We make really small ones. This is uh, that scale at the bottom, the thruster for uh, a vehicle in space. Um, you know, that, that scale at the bottom is eight inches long, and so you can see that that, that complicated uh, device is um, maybe the size of a basketball, and that would maneuver the rocket uh, vehicle around in uh, orbit. Uh, we make pretty s uh, small rocket motors. This uh, is actually being tested upside down in, in actual use. This would be mounted to the top of a space capsule, the, the most modern space capsule that is currently in the, in the in I guess it's not really in use, but it, they want to use it. But th this would mount on top, and if there was an emergency, that rocket uh, motor, group of rocket motors would fire and lift the uh, astronauts and their capsule out of, hopefully, out of harm's way. We make solid rocket motors that are bigger, that would be launched out of a submarine. And then we make um, these uh, boosters right here. These are Atlas boosters. They're three feet diameter, 60 feet long. They're poured in one huge, massive, you know, cookie dough kind of uh, intr intrusion, and um, you know they're pretty substantial. I, I think they might use as many as five of them on a on a vehicle to get heavy loads into space. And the last thing <coughs> we make at Aerojet is electricity. We have a uh, a uh, six megawatt solar field, and that uh, that uh, energy is about maybe thirty or thirty percent of our energy consumption that we use for, for groundwater remediation at, in Sacramento. Um, we use a lot of electricity to run ultraviolet lights. Anyway, Aerojet, we're located here at uh, Mira Loma High School. And uh, Aerojet is located out uh, east of 
uh, Sunrise Boulevard, south of Highway 50. This outline is uh, our plant boundary, about 8,500 acres. We own most of the former McDonnell Douglas uh, test site. That operated in the 19 late 50s, early, early to mid 1960s. Uh, that's where I spend a lot of my time is down here. So that's where most of the talk is going to focus. Um, and here's your Arcade Creek right here. And your seven stations are located um, you know, in that darker blue area. So you, you have a very impressive website. You, you seem to do quite an ambitious uh, set of work. That's very impressive. So just to set the stage for Aerojet, this is an EPA uh, illustration of Aerojet. Here's the 8,500 acres, the original Aerojet Superfund site. It's been around since uh, you know, the early 1980s. Um, the groundwater plume is this red line right here. That's also part of what would be known as the Aerojet Superfund site. And so the EPA has divided the, the project up into operable units, just different ways of managing the activities. Um, bef before I move to those, I just want to point out that this gray area right here on the, along the northern boundary is area that we carved out. We delisted it from the Superfund process. We were able to demonstrate that it didn't have any you know, contaminants, any issues in the soil anyway that uh, warranted a Superfund action. Superfund being um, the federal program that uh, industry pays taxes into a fund. They accumulate a lot of money. They use the money to pay for remediation so that they can um, clean up the soil and groundwater from past activities. For people that have gone out of business, that can't afford it, Aerojet, we have to pay it ourselves. Um, and so uh, anyway, we have these operable units, the orange is one unit, the green, the blue, the purple. These are all um, soil issues and, and groundwater as well because uh, chemicals hit the ground at the different stations here and affected the ground. And then the, you can see by these arrows, the groundwater flows in a lot of different directions out away from the site. We also have some areas to the east that we have to deal with for soil and groundwater as well, but those are owned by other entities and we have to work with them to solve those problems. Uh, Aerojet back in the early 1960s had like 22,000 employees. We did a lot of business back then. Um, Gene's father was one of the employees uh, years ago. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of chemicals got away from us. It was pretty common back in those days. Uh, you know, you were you were uh, building building missiles to you know protect us from uh, the, the USSR. Anyway, we have. Uh, we have um, a uh, groundwater operable unit, the western groundwater operable unit out in Rancho Cordova. And then we have this uh, perimeter groundwater unit that is uh, along our, our boundaries and incorporates uh, things just off site and uh, in our existing facilities. We also, I mentioned earlier, the McDonnell Douglas facility, it's down here. And uh, that's where I spend all my time. EPA didn't ex get it uh, entirely accurate. And so I just wanted to point out that, that out of the 3,900 acres that we started with, we've been able to release all the green area. And we still have these uh, orange areas that are part of the site, the state Superfund site, if you will. And, um, and so that's about 500 acres left to go. So here's a simpler version of uh, that image, the McDonnell Douglas site, Aerojet with the groundwaters flowing in all these directions, north, south, all degrees uh, west. That's where my office is, uh, along Sunrise Boulevard, a few blocks in toward Gold River. So the reason we have uh, groundwater flowing in all those directions is because 60%, maybe closer to 70, uh, uh, of Aerojet property is covered with dredge tailings. And, and basically, dredge tailings are like a, a natural sponge. Here are the dredge tailings. Uh, back uh, in the, I don't know, the 20s through uh, early 1960s, uh, large dredges uh, dug up the soil down to maybe 100 feet in some places and sorted it out, washed it, and separated the gold from the uh, rock. They stacked the rock up in these distinctive patterns. There's a big pile across the way. Here's undredged material. And so they left us with this 
real rocky, porous media. It rains two feet a year out at Aerojet, maybe more sometimes, and all that water goes into the ground. It doesn't run off. It stays in the ground and mounds up. And so I've got this illustration for that. Here are the dredge tailings. Um, I just want to point out the horizontal axis is quite long. This represents a 20 foot tall by 100 foot wide building. There's a lot of compression in the x axis. And then the y axis you know, illustrates how rugged the dredge tailings are. There's my six foot person to represent you know, scale. And uh, here's, our, here's our groundwater, the water table. And so what happens is you, we get lots of rain, two feet a year. It flows onto the ground. All of it goes into the dredge tailings, not so much into the undredged material. Most of it runs off to the creeks. We get a little bit of recharge into the undredged land. And so groundwater flow comes across like this, relatively fast coming off the mounds. And then it slows down and is more constant as it moves westwardly. And this little model over here can kind of illustrate that uh, uh, later. So zooming in on that area where the building was, now we're at a more reasonable scale, less distortion, my six-foot person, my building. And so here's groundwater flowing in the same direction. And so in order to figure out what the problems might be, we build monitor wells. And so we have wells screened at different levels. This is plastic screen right here bunch of slots. We use mostly steel, though, but that's too heavy for me to bring in. We have other examples there, and we use those drill bits, uh, big ones, to, uh, to, to bore down into the ground. Uh, maybe close to 500 feet is probably five, maybe five and a half. That's how, how deep we go in some places. Um, depth to water varies from as little as maybe 40 feet in, in uh, certain areas to close to 160 feet in uh, other areas further to the south. Farther you get away from the American River, the deeper the water is. Higher the ground, the deeper the water. So you can see the plume moving across the site. And so that's what we're looking for. And once we found, find it, we figure it out. We uh, try to figure out, you know, we figure out how to, how to stop it. And so we build a large extraction well, uh, hopefully out in front of the plumes, not always. but um, we, we build this extraction well and start pumping on it, and we create this depression in, the, uh, in the, the water table, and that causes the water to flow into the well, control the plume, and we pump it into our treatment system. And in this case, I'm showing four vessels filled with some sort of adsorption media that, that takes the, the contaminant out of the water. And so we go from our purple contaminated water to our blue clean water, and then we discharge it to the ground. Maybe it goes into a creek down to the river, maybe it infiltrates, goes to a well. But um, here's what a, a small, relatively small extraction well looks like, 100 gallons a minute, production casing, the electrical components that, that power the submersible pump down around uh, you know, 140 feet probably, the uh, sounding port where we can put our transducers to measure the pressure of water and get uh, water level elevation, you know, some pressure valves, some gauges. Um, a sample port so we can see what the water you know, looks like when submit it for analysis. Here's examples of our screen, the large diameter wire wrap screen, some louvers. I have that piece over there, you know, that piece I have over there, and, and that's probably a different piece, but it's the same stuff as that. Anyway, different material, stainless steel, very durable, very corrosion resistant. Mild steel, a lot cheaper, but not as corrosion. It, it can be affected more. Same materials over here. We, we build wells out of a lot of different things. So this is uh, how we uh, you know, put a well in the ground if we need to hide it or you know, make it less uh, visible. But when you open the lid up, um, it's the same basic kind of information. You know, the transducer is right there. We don't have the pressure sensing devices. That would be further down the line. But um, anyway. Uh, just to summarize what we have out there, we have 13 well fields. I'll show you diagrams of where they're located. We use these uh, alpha uh, numeric um, labels to, to keep track of them. We have 10 treatment plants that do different um, technologies for volatile organic chemicals, mostly trichloroethylene. That's a solvent that is used to degrease uh, materials. Um, we use these different um, 
methods, air stripping, carbon. I brought some examples that we can, uh, over in those little jars, we have some carbon. We use ultraviolet radiation. That's why we burn so much electricity and peroxide, hydrogen peroxide. The, the radiation destroys the hydrogen peroxide, creates hydroxyl rattles, radicals. Those radicals then go after the uh, volatile organic chemicals. Um, Hypox is hydrogen peroxide and ozone, and that's a different uh, technology. But we have to treat down to a half a part per billion. And um, a half a part per billion, I hope I get this right, but I think it's three seconds in a, uh, in a century would be the, I mean, one part per billion is three seconds in a century. So we have to treat to equivalent to um, a second and a half of, you know, in a century. That, that, that's a little tiny number. Um, nitrosodimethylamine, that's a, a pretty bad chemical. We have to treat to point, well, it's two parts per trillion, but two thousandths of a part per billion. That's like 32 seconds. Wait a minute, that's 64 seconds in a million years would be how, how you could kind of envision that. That's even hard to envision. Um, and then perchlorate, we use biodegradation and ion exchange. I have some resin beads over here as an example, little tiny white beads uh, that pull the uh, perchlorate out of the water. Um, I have a, another uh, jar over there of the used resin. It's kind of rusty looking due to the rust that's in the water. Anyway, we have a little bit better protection, or I mean treatment level, it's, it's four parts per billion. So anyway, let's talk about where these places are located. Um, we started out in 1983, basically. Well, through, throughout the 1980s, we, we built a bunch of facilities. Uh, we, we got started at, at, at this location in 1983, but, but basically we have A and B at the east side, and then B, E, and two F plants, F north, F south, along the north, western, and western boundaries, and the well fields that go with them. And then um, by 2000, we had consolidated E and F and built the American River uh, facility. We have wells on either side of the American River at uh, the park here and, and the fish hatchery. And we piped that water all the way back to Aerojet and uh, treat it at this location and then discharge it to Buffalo Creek and carry it all the way back down to the river. So um, anyway, by 2010, we had a lot more things going, bigger well fields, more of them, um, and so on the other side of the river in Ansel Hoffman Park, we have a facility, and up at the street called Bahamut, we have the Get L facility. So we have all these different things happening. Um, at Mather Field, we have Get H, and the reason it's A is because that's Aerojet. Uh, Boeing is our partner in this particular facility, and they have their own here along uh, Douglas Road, but Get H B for Boeing. So this slide illustrates how we've progressed over the years. Starting in 83 at Get D, we pumped a small amount of water. And uh, over time, we've ramped up as we've uh, built more gets, built more wells, increased the pumping rate. And so by last year, we were pumping close to 15,000 gallons per minute every day, all the time, on average anyway. And so, and then Boeing started a little bit later, and you know they add to the to the water. Um, so we pump a lot of water. Uh, same image, but now we're talking um, volume, millions of gallons. And so last year we were almost eight billion gallons of water uh, by all the Aerojet facilities, and um, Boeing got it up into the you know mid nines, nine billion gallons of water. And so when you look at where does all that water go after we've cleaned it, um, we haven't really found anybody to use it, so we uh, ended up putting a, a lot of it back into the ground via recharge wells, just the opposite. We pump water out of the ground in this well, we put it back into the ground in a, in a different but similar well. Um, and then we put it onto the dredge tailings to let it soak in. When we started operating our biological systems, we found that we couldn't get that water back into the ground through a well because all the biomass, all the little tiny cells that, that break off of the pr in the process clog the filter, the screens, and so we had to you know, get, it, get rid of it somehow. And so for a while we put a lot of it on the ground as we worked our way into getting it into the river. And most of it goes into the American River, and uh, some of it goes into Morrison Creek. And we do this under 
uh, permits from the federal government and the state, the National Pollution Elimination Discharge System, NPDES. So in summary, um, since 1983, and including some credit for 2012, you know, we're looking at probably 110 billion gallons of water, nearly a million pounds of contaminants, probably closer to 120 wells uh, that we operate, but at least, you know, over 100. Uh, the pumping rates, depending on the well, have this wide range. Uh, most of them are probably in the two to 300 gallons a minute range, but uh, we have one that goes to 900 at, uh, I think, it's either Bahamont or Ansel Hoffman Park. So talking about uh, treatment technologies, beginning with VOCs and NDMA, we use these ultraviolet light reactors. And uh, this is just the bank of the, a bank of them in the first facility. You turn the lights off, it looks like that. But uh, here's a better picture of what, what they look like. And, and basically what happens is the water, the, the un untreated water, the contaminated water comes and it flows through these three vessels. The lights are bright. They burn the chemicals, and then we get this nice blue treated water. It moves on to the next, next facility. Um, the more modern facility would be these big, huge reactors. These are 12 lamps, ultraviolet lamps in each one. There's six going this way, and then six going into the, you know, into the screen. And so what happens is the water comes out of the main discharge pipe into the bottom of the tank. It goes through the inside of this vessel. It's very bright, very energetic, and there's peroxide there. Things are getting uh, destroyed left and right and uh, flows out the top to the final process, which is air stripping. These towers are filled with little skeletal, maybe I've forgotten now which ones are in these, but, but they're basically, say, tennis balls, skeletal tennis balls, maybe hockey pucks. They have, I mean, they, they create a lot of surface area. And so what happens is the water comes from this building, it flows into the top, and it's trickling down, and it's passing through all these little skeletal um, frames, and the air we blow, pull in from these filters, and we blow it up through the tower. And so you get this counter current flow of media, the air being volatile, uh, pardon me, the chemicals being volatile, want to leave the water and go into the air and um, exit into the atmosphere. If it's really contaminated, as your primary treatment, you would have to have another system to capture that air and send it into either a catalytic converter that burns it and uh, destroys it you know, at a high enough temperature to truly uh, destroy it, or it might go into the carbon, which I have a little vial over there of carbon, and be absorbed by the, the carbon, which you could then regenerate or you know, ship to an incinerator or something. Um, so anyway, the, I guess the last technology would be adsorption vessels. These are, I think they're like eight feet diameter, 12 feet tall. They're filled with different uh, material. We have these pressure vessels to filter the water. We want to make sure we get anything that might block the pores in this very fine material. And so we, we have to have you know, bag filters first. But, but basically, we operate two, a pair of vessels at a time. We use this complicated set of valves to keep track of things, but we have a lead vessel. The contaminated water comes in from the main line, goes to the top. It flows down into the, uh, through the, the media, out, shifts to the lag vessel. And the reason we have this pair is we want to get all the contaminants in the lead vessel. And as soon as we, we uh, see a breakthrough, we first detect chemical in the, the transfer pipeline. That's our signal to uh, start planning on changing out the vessels and switching. So the lag vessel becomes lead. We put new material in the former lead vessel, and it becomes lag. And so we're constantly moving things back and forth. Uh, and it takes, you know, depending on the concentration, but we're talking like changing out once a year. So uh, I guess I forgot about the biological process. Here's, here's fluidized bed reactors. There's, this, this is two of them at, at our largest facility. Here's, the, here's what they look like from uh, the other angle, the four vessels. Here's the guy up on top to give you an idea of the scale. Um, and so what happens is we pump in contaminated water at the bottom. It, uh, it, 
when I say fluidize, these, these beds, these vessels are, are partially filled with the carbon, uh, a carbon um, like say from coconut shells for instance, this example over here. The, the water creates a turbulent environment and the bacteria, uh, we got it from I think Smucker's Jam, uh, we used their bac their, some bacteria from uh, their process to um, inoculate the vessels. That bacteria, we feed it ethanol and uh, it, we feed it enough ethanol because we, we, we try to overfeed them basically, the bacteria. And so what happens is when they're respiring, uh, trying to consume that ethanol, they're grabbing all the dissolved oxygen out of the water. They're um, grabbing the nitrate out of the water. They're trying to get to the oxygen, NO3, O2. And then finally they will go for the perchlorate, which is um, four oxygens on a, uh, on a chloride. And I forgot to mention, I, I talked about TCE being a solvent to clean. Perchlorate is the oxidizer. It's the, um, it's the compound that uh, you, you burn with your propellant, uh, say aluminum and other compounds, and that's what gives the thrust in a solid rocket engine. Um, and so, anyway, more complicated pipes and valves, a guy standing there uh, gives you kind of the scale. And so we, we have the water coming in that's untreated. It gets blended with a little bit of the, the treated water and into the vessel. And we have to keep these things circulating because even when we're not pumping water, we still have to circulate them because we need that bed to, to stay active. If, if when we have power outages, the beds crash down and compact themselves, it's a problem to get them restarted and floated back up and, and active again. And this is what that, that, that uh, treatment plant looks like. The fluidized beds, the uh, piping are inside here. We have a surge tank that helps on those emergency shutdowns to keep the, the collapse uh, under control. We have an ethanol uh, storage system here. Th uh, this building, we only use half of it. The other half here would be if we wanted to expand, which we are currently planning on making some expansions to fill this area with, with uh, um, devices. Uh, we have clarifiers that help uh, separate the water and the biomass uh, before it gets to the building with the two reactors that are located here. And again, this building uh, has room to, uh, to be doubled in size. And then we have our air strippers that uh, send the water to the American River. Big facility. Good thing Aerojet has a lot of land that we can you know, build this type of facility at. But in other places, we have to blend into the neighborhoods. And so this is, uh, this is where Get J is. My office is in this half of the building. In the other half of the building are where those big uh, tan colored uh, vessels are located. Over here at Get K, we have one of those uh, even, I think it's uh, like a two story uh, UV reactor. You have to get up on a catwalk to get to the top of it. But um, it has plenty of room for an expansion if we have to, but we had to build it to look like this to match the church that is located right here. <laughs> and so uh, at Ansel Hoffman Park, um, we, we had to build uh, this particular uh, structure to house one of those UV reactors so that uh, we would blend in to the clubhouse that was across the parking lot to the, uh, in this direction. And at uh, the Bahamut facility, we built this house-like structure so that we could have our UV reactors, the ones that I showed you with the, the, the lines and some uh, uh, tan tanks. And we had to fit in there um, uh, nicely. So we do try to um, you know, work with our neighbors. So now we're, uh, we're talking about the former McDonnell Douglas uh, facility. And here's uh, you know, what's left of the uh, state Superfund site. It started out this big, but over time we were able to convince the state that uh, we could um, we could cut down on the on the size and uh, focus our effort on the the real problem areas. And this whole area, except for down here, which is an industrial park, um, will be uh, it's known right now as the Rio del Oro development project for the city of Rancho Cordova. And uh, you know this area can proceed. We still have to work, of course, on these areas. So just a little history, uh, the MACDAC facility was used for the Saturn 4B uh, rocket. It was the third stage of the Apollo vehicle. It, uh, I think it basically got the, uh, the, the astronauts into a, a very robust 
Earth orbit and sent them on their way to the moon. And, um, and so this is the vehicle right here. This is, you know, you can see the rocket engine here, but here's a close-up of that rocket engine. Here it is in the test stand, and it looks like it's uh, getting ready to fire because you can see all this cryogenic, um, um, I don't know what it is. It's, it's you know, probably just frozen vapor. Uh, this was a uh, hydrogen and uh, oxygen system, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. That's why the TCE was uh, used so prevalently in the rocket industry is you absolutely have to have every part cleaner than you can imagine clean because liquid oxygen is so reactive to any kind of organic matter. Here's what that test stand looks like up close as, we're, uh, as, we're, as they're doing a, a firing in the late 1960s. So getting into the bio uh, aspect of it, we have some micro photographs of the bacteria that they think um, consume the perchlorate. Here's how the perchlorate ClO4 is reduced down to chloride, oxygen, carbon dioxide, biomass, simplified in that diagram. But we basically feed it some sort of organic matter. In, in, in my examples here, I'm going to talk about uh, ethanol and citric acid and uh, show you lots of graphs about what, what uh, results we, we've come up with. We, we, we have worked a little bit with uh, TCE, um, made some experiments. That's a lot harder to do. I, I give you a simplified diagram. It goes from TCE to 1,2-DCE. And usually in California, it stalls. The, the indigenous bacteria in California can't take it past um, DCE. Um, and so you never, you never really get all the way to ethene. Um, and, and so we have tried inoculating the ground with uh, KB1. That's a, an acceptable bacteria uh, consortium that, that has been shown to, to carry it all the way through to the, the end, but it didn't work on when, when we tried it on one of my projects. Anyway, for citric acid, you might wonder how much do we need? Um, it's basically just uh, chemistry, stoichiometry. We, we have for dissolved oxygen, we we need two molecules of citric acid for nine molecules of dissolved oxygen. And uh, so this spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, we can input the concentrations. In this case, five of DO, 13 of nitrate, 0.3 uh, milligrams per liter of perchlorate. And, and so I think the way it works is we take that number, uh, divide it by this number, multiply it by the molar ratio and the molecular weight of citric acid to come up with this demand. We do that for each of the components, add it all up, add an efficiency factor to it because you never know whether these values are going to stay constant, whether or not there's other competing uh, demands on the, uh, the donor. And so in this case, we're, we're saying we're going to double it just to make sure we come up with the unit demand of uh, citric acid, multiply it by the flow rate, and end up with our dosing rate, in this case, 11, eight, 811 milliliters per hour. So at 35 gallons a minute, we're basically dosing almost three teaspoons, almost a tablespoon of citric acid into that water in order to get the bacteria to do the job. And um, you can create spreadsheets. I don't, didn't bring one for uh, ethanol, but you can use molasses, acetic acid, glycol. There's lots of different things that that bugs uh, will uh, consume. And these are indigenous uh, bacteria that I'm talking about, not, not anything we've inoculated, except for the attempt at TCE. So coming back to the, to the project, we, we have tried different experiments. Uh, back in 2001 or two, we tried a radio bio, bio barrier concept using sodium oleate. It's a precursor to soap. It's soluble in water. We pumped a big volume of this sodium oleate into the aquifer. We hope to get it out at a certain radius where it would find enough calcium and magnesium to precipitate out, create a bathtub ring in a sense. And then after it precipitated out, we would reverse the process, pump the water back into the well, and as the contaminated water passed through this, this bathtub ring, it would consume the oleate and its breakdown products, and we'd pump out clean water. Didn't work. Okay, we did another project. This one I'll talk about later. But we basically had two extraction wells 
a recharge well in the middle, injection well, and so we pumped water out of the two ends, combined it, added some ethanol, and put it into the ground. And I'll show you the results of that in a little bit. Uh, Boeing is doing the same thing over here at, at their source site, the Sigma facility, and they're using acetic acid, but they're doing it parallel to groundwater flow. And then we've done some other experiments. We tried brute force, if you will, flushing. We took ethanol, put it in a bunch of water, released it into the Vado zone, the, the part of the ground between the land surface and the water table, and tried to create biological action to degrade perchlorate there. Uh, we probably degraded a little bit, but I think mostly we just moved it around and we didn't, uh, we didn't probably, it wasn't gonna be that effective. Uh, we also tried this gaseous electron donor injection technology that was brought to us by the consultant CDM. In that case, we took nitrogen gas, the carrier, and we added 10% hydrogen. We did try propane, that didn't work, but we took this 10% hydrogen, pumped it into the ground, or actually released it into the ground under pressure, created this, this oxygen-free um, atmosphere in the ground and tried to get the bacteria to consume the electrons that are hydrogen ions and, um, and degrade the perchlorate. That appeared to work, um, but the cost of nitrogen gas is really expensive and it would have been a really, got to figure out a better way um, to get that one done. And so then the last project that we'll talk about is by uh, gravel bed reactor, or what I like to call the, the box of rocks. So moving uh, back to the, this, uh, this WNN project where we pumped 20 gallons a minute out of this well, 40 out of this well, combined them and put them into the recharge well in the center, um, we created this barrier that, uh, that you know, was capable of dealing with the, the perchlorate. And so I'm gonna want you to pay attention mostly to the green well, this monitor well that's immediately down gradient. Uh, to some extent, the, uh, we, we'll, we'll see some good things in this well 138 and also well 166. So this is what it looks like. Chain link fence uh, enclosure, pretty small. It's got uh, our uh, recharge well right here, our storage tank for our drums of ethanol. And then we had to disinfect the well. We had to kill the bacteria right around the well because we didn't want it to clog the well. And then that, that disinfectant would dissipate a few feet away from the well. And then the bacteria that was still out there could consume that ethanol and degrade the perchlorate. And, and here's a close up of the, the valving system and filters. So a summary, 60 gallons a minute. Here you can see the, the volumes of water. About a gallon a day of ethanol went into the system, 200 gallons total. Uh, we operated for nearly eight months and we disinfected one hour a day. So, you know, I, I think this was, this was a fun project. It, it, it was successful in some ways, but we didn't finish it or we didn't carry it on past eight months. So, it, you mathematicians, if you like to model groundwater, this is uh, a, uh, a numerical, the output of a numerical groundwater model that simulates the the flow using very complicated uh, mathematical processes. But you can see that we can draw the water into the extraction wells at each side. We create kind of a dead spot that not a whole lot of flow is going on. And then the water flows mostly out of the recharge well, the injection well, and moves, continues to move down gradient, but a certain amount recirculate back towards each of the extraction wells and creates this biologically active zone between the two, the, the, the two wells. And, um, and then we have, in this case, we have this hydraulic control out beyond the two wells. And so we were able to create maybe an 800 foot wide control zone where we could capture chemical and degrade it in the ground. And so here's, here's the data. Our time frame between when we operated this eight month period Here's the before chemistry. The perchlorate was, uh, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 maybe up here for the most part. Not so much at the first extraction well. If you, uh, as we pumped the extraction wells, you can see that it declined because, well, this one increased because the average, I mean, we created this average concentration and as it flowed back to the extraction well number one, it increased the concentration there, it diluted it at the second one. 
And so at that green monitor well, just immediately down gradient, within a few weeks, we had degraded all that perchlorate that started out around 2,500, say. It was pretty much all degraded. Didn't take long to, to knock that stuff down. At the well, that the transgradient well, the blue well that was off to the side, took a little bit longer, but then it was pretty well, uh, perchlorate was knocked out after uh, just a few more weeks. And it lasted, even after we shut it off, it lasted for many months afterwards, you know, approaching years for, for this, um, for this uh, well immediately down gradient. These open symbols represent non-detect. And so after like five months, the transgradient well started to return to normal. Um, this well, I think, I don't have, inf I have information out here beyond the graft and it's still showing evidence of biological activity because the, the well still has not recovered to the top. If you look at the far down gradient well, you can see that the decline, this decline represents that clean water, you know, moving towards that well. So same kind of uh, uh, results for nitrate. Very quickly, the nitrate at the two nearby monitor wells went down to nothing, and uh, out at the uh, far monitor well down gradient, it, it declined. Sulfate. This is where we, we tried to create those really harsh anaerobic conditions that are necessary for TCE degradation. You know, we, we tried to inoculate with that KB1 bacteria, and so we created some pretty stinky, you know, hydrogen sulfide, really foul conditions, and we, you know, got it down into uh, where sulfate disappeared and uh, reduced at the transgradient well. But uh, we couldn't get the TCE really to go, um, and I'll show you that in a minute. But one of the one of the downsides of all this activity is that we mobilize manganese. And manganese has a drinking water limit. It's a secondary limit. It's ma mainly due to aesthetics. It'll turn toilets uh, brown. It'll, it'll maybe affect your laundry. So they have a secondary standard. And so we mobilized the iron, the iron as well. But we mobilized the magnesium in uh, these two monitor wells. And it stayed mobilized. And once we created that nasty condition down there to degrade this, this, uh, these contaminants, it's hard to get the oxygen into that region again and make the water fresh. Uh, and so we solved one problem and created another one. It's a lesser problem, but it's still, still you know, maybe not acceptable in, uh, in a high volume sort of way. And that's one of the reasons that we didn't pursue this project any further. TCE, um, you know, you, you can't really see that we did anything to the TCE. Not a whole lot changed. Uh, well, well, pardon me, I should take that back. Um, we did affect TCE a little bit in the green well, uh, immediately downgrade it. We did see a decline, uh, but not so much in the, the well farther away, the transgradient well. And we did create the no, no cis 1, 2 DCE before and during the early parts, but once we tried to, to take the TCE out, we created um, the cis one too, so we, we know we were we were doing it to some extent, but we couldn't get the KB one to, you know, to take. Okay, moving on to uh, the gravel bed reactor. Uh, this is what it looks like. My box of rocks. It's it's essentially a forty foot shipping container, eight feet square. It's what you see on trucks uh, driving around the the from uh, Oakland at the at the harbor there. Uh, the influent in is right here where we pump the water in. We have this uh, monitor well in the middle of it to keep track, and here's the effluent in where we can put in our, our, our probe for the, uh, to measure the oxidation reduction potential. Uh, but before we get too far along in that discussion, I want to talk about the column test that we did in advance. So that large box, before we made the decision to build it, we conducted some experiments in our shed with this four foot long, or pardon me, three foot long, four inch diameter piece of plastic where we pump water that's in our, our, our cooler here up from the bottom through the rocks out the top. And here's our, here's our pump, our probes for measuring pH and, and uh, oxidation reduction potential, ORP. Um, if you look inside of our, uh, our cooler, this is where we stored our five gallon carboys of contaminated water. Our citric acid stock solution, 
we'd take pipettes and spritz in a certain dose into each of our vessels. We had a thermometer inside and if I can go back one slide. We used this device right here. This is an external temperature control. So our freezer didn't actually freeze. It just kept it really cold. And so that way we could keep biological action in our carboys from happening and we could allow all that biological action to, to occur there. And so looking at some data real quick, we started out at six to 7,000 parts per billion of, um, of perchlorate. You can see our flow rates as we, as we moved across with time. We did have to start over right here um, because of some leaks in our, in our column, but, but we started off hot to get the bacteria going and then we proceeded slower and, and we gradually ramped up the, the, um, the, uh, the dose and the, f and the flow rate to try to figure out if we could degrade this stuff. And as it turns out, we can. We degraded the perchlorate with the bacteria that were just on those rocks. Uh, it did it both times uh, at this moderate rate. And then as we got higher in the flow rate, it didn't, uh, didn't behave as well as we'd liked but it was enough to convince us that we should scale it up. Nitrate, pretty constant nitrate values, just a couple of parts per million, but all non-detects. Sulfate, uh, pretty constant influent. We did get into sulfate reducing conditions right here. That gives kind of a bad sulfur smell. And, um, and then chloride, we did create chloride because six parts per million of perchlorate is enough to create a. Uh, a similar amount of, of, um, of uh, chloride. So we, we, did, we did increase our chloride content. So getting back to the box of rocks, this is what, it, uh, what, what we wanted to do. Pump it in at this end, all purple and contaminated. And as it flows up and over to the drain pipe, uh, it gets clean. And um, this is all, once we release the water here, it's all, this operates all with gravity. So. Uh, that's another reason we wanted to use this technology is it saves on electricity for the pumping rates. Um, so here, we're building it. We took a box, we dug a hole, we leveled it, flipped it over, knocked the roof off of it, opened up the doors and started you know, putting in this uh, felt. It's a polyester felt lining. Needed some uh, padding against the walls. Our PVC liner, basically swimming pool technology. They tell me that people someplace buy these things and build swimming pools out of them in their backyard, um, or at least lap pools. Yeah, that's what they, <laughs> I've seen pictures of them in like in New York City where they have them in the parking stall and a big deck around them and people are swimming in them. Uh, and so here's the box ready to fill with rocks. There's the well, that's my contribution to the, to the project. I insisted on having a well in the middle. And so, uh, we use just simple ABS plastic pipe, you know, sewer pipe, drill some holes in it, put it at the bottom, fill it with rocks, crushed rocks. Um, this was easy crushed rocks. Uh, it's going to create iron and manganese, going to release it because it's just simple, uh, you know, generic rocks. But you could buy limestone and uh, not have as much iron and manganese as a problem. But this is what it looks like on top. The influent in a high level switch in case uh, something happens and it starts to fill up and overflow. My well inside a protective yellow piece of steel. And so um, here's what, how we got started with uh, our citric acid. This uh, Neptune tank, it holds about 90 gallons of fluid. We have our dosing pump right here, a graduated cylinder where we can uh, check the, the flow rate to make sure we know what we're putting in if the, if the dosatron isn't doing what we want it. And then this device is a data logger for the ORP probe and it keeps track. The, the, the device operates, or the, the system operates so that if the ORP <coughs> rises to a certain level, it shuts itself off. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Got tired of mixing granular bags, 50 pound bags of, <coughs> of citric acid in water. <coughs> so we invested in a thousand gallon tank. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> uh, 
after we built it, we did some tests on it. Uh, the idea here of the reason we wanted to build it was at that WNN project where we pump the water out of the ground, <coughs> dose it, <coughs> release it, we lose control of it. We don't have, you know, the aquifer is, is not uniform. It, um, you know, the water goes wherever it's going to go. And, uh, and so <coughs> we, we create the iron and manganese. It, it's gone. We might have to clean it later. We didn't want to do that. So <coughs> the concept for the box of rocks was create our own aquifer. It's got its own characteristics. We can make it uniform. We can um, control the, to some extent, the amount of iron and manganese that's released. And we have the surface, an oxidizing environment, to re-oxidize the iron and manganese and let it precipitate out, make our own desert varnish. And uh, we have 140 feet of veto zone to attenuate that iron and manganese. And so <coughs> one of the tests we did was we took a fluorescein dye. <coughs> it was red. And we mixed up a batch, put a slug of it into the, into the device, pumped at 36 gallons a minute. And so this, this um, single hump of an uh, out, output shows that we had plug flow, a uniform wave of this uh, dye made it through the, uh, the device or through the box. And so it took a little over three hours to get in. And so that's our residence time. And that helps us figure out how, how much capacity that the box uh, could, could treat. Um, if, we if we would have seen a different type of hump or more than one hump, we would know that we had short circuits in the box and that we wouldn't have nearly as much capacity. There might be some, some uh, untreated water making, making it through the system. If you change the scale to gallons, you can see that our, our box is about 7,200 gallons a minute. So we started out at almost one gallon a minute in our column and upscaled it to 7,200 gallons a minute, I mean gallons. And, um, and, and so that also helps us understand capacity. We, we have about a 50% porosity in our, in our rock, uh, box of rocks there. Uh, we looked at temperature to see uh, you know, how much of an uh, effect. The water level and ground level are pretty much the same, so we didn't expect a whole lot of temperature influence. But, but there was <coughs> some visible. Here, here's the uh, <coughs> water temperature at, at on one day, and uh, it's a little colder. That's ambient temperature up there. Did it a second day. It was colder, and we see the effects of it being colder. But it doesn't, didn't really affect the, the treatment. <coughs> we started the box at different rates. We had to, to you know, because we had to grow the bacteria and get it, get it, you know, get it going that way. So we, we, we pumped at different rates, measured how much water was in the box, <coughs> plotted it up. And at a hydraulic capacity, it might be 200 gallons a minute. But we probably can't operate at the full hydraulic capacity. I'd guess that we're probably only going to be able to operate at 100 or so gallons a minute because there's a certain amount of residence time that's required for the bacteria to consume the citric acid and take care of the contaminants. Um, another test we did was sam <coughs> sample halfway point at that yellow well. Here's the nitrate in, the perchlorate in, <coughs> different depths. In the in the in the box, and so and then here's the effluent. So nitrate, no problem. Halfway through the box, it was gone. Mm. <coughs> Perchlorate, on the other hand, uh, I wasn't dosing it at a high enough amount, and so <coughs> halfway through the box, it went from about 240 to seven to ten. That's five half lives, and uh, it left the box without much treatment. So <coughs> we were basically dealing with front half of the box, and the whole back half of the box didn't have enough citric acid in it to do much more. And so <coughs> we have a lot of capacity is what that leap tells us, and we need to pay better attention to the, uh, the amount of dosing we give it. Sulfate, <coughs> no change in the sulfate. So that's another uh, way of knowing that we didn't uh, have enough going in. <coughs> so here's our here's our operational data. We, 
we recirculated for a while to grow bacteria, and then we uh, <coughs> started out at different rates, increasing up to a maximum rate about 45 gallons a minute. And then we've been operating pretty much when we can around 30 to 35 gallons a minute. Uh, we do have, <coughs> have some problems clogging the dosing pump, um, running out of fluids. Uh, it's, uh, it's not been uh, the completely uh, uh, easy. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, our, our dosing down here, you can see the variation in, uh, in how we've dosed it. But <coughs> up here, we're at, say, 35 gallons a minute, typical. Down here, this represents three teaspoons per minute. And so, again, it shows you the, the relative proportion of it. doesn't take much donor to get the, the system to work. Our ORP, we need to keep it uh, down here in the minus 400 range, um, maybe minus uh, 390. It shuts off when it gets into the minus 380 range. It automatically shuts itself off. But, but anyway, we had some challenges. Looking at the data, though, uh, for the most part, nitrate, uh, nitrate pretty much goes. Yeah. Around, starts out around 10, 11 parts per million and uh, pretty easily get it down to non-detect. And uh, more recently, we have uh, been having some uh, values just above the detection limit. The reason I talk about nitrate, it's not really a contaminant that Aerojet deals with, but nitrate is a major contaminant in the Fresno area, the southern San Joaquin Valley, uh, dairy uh, farms, agriculture that over-fertilizes. They create a lot of excess nitrate that goes into the groundwater and then people that rely on wells in the southern part of the Central Valley uh, have to deal with the fact that their wells are contaminated with nitrate and if you get too much nitrate you end up with blue baby syndrome where they the babies are born and they're blue and it's because they're not uh, getting enough oxygen and uh, and so that, that's why we have a have a nitrate standard of uh, 45 uh, parts per million up in here so and so, so we wanted to share, I, I went to Fresno in June and talked to people about how, at a, at a symposium, talked to them about how here's some technology you might want to consider for a dairy uh, or for you know, some nitrate contamination uh, that seems to be really simple, relatively simple to use and, and would be uh, something a, a rancher could put, put to use. So perchlorate, in this particular case, not very much perchlorate. Um, but we are able to treat it after we got things, uh, you know, ramped up and, and operating well. Sulfate, uh, similar to nitrate, and we have had occasions when we've overdosed it and created some really foul-smelling water when you go out and, uh, you know, check on the device. Iron and manganese, this is the influent. We expected to see iron and manganese when we built the, b the well brand new out of steel, not too too uh, surprising to see it. And then, for the most part, iron and manganese have been non-detect in, uh, in the influent going into the box. But you, you can see that we have created, we have mobilized iron and manganese. And, um, and we expected it, as we see, decline because that fresh surface area on the rocks that we put in the box, we expect to strip off a certain amount that's readily available. And then once we clear that out, there isn't really any more, or not, not as much to release. And so we expected this decline. And uh, I think this recent rise here is due to some overdosing. Um, because when we get the sulfate, you'll see that we, I didn't want that to happen, but I guess I didn't show sulfate. Oh, maybe I did show sulfate back here. Anyway, we, w we, w we have been into this sulfate reducing region. So I guess I'm, I'm pretty much done with the talk here. The last thing I wanted to mention is uh, we are working on other ways to degrade perchlorate biologically. And here we have little pea-sized particles of elemental sulfur. Uh, we are relying on sulfur oxidizing bacteria to do the same thing, to <coughs> take the oxygen out of the water, off the nitrate from the perchlorate, and get rid of those contaminants. And um, 
and replace it with sulfate, which is a little bit of a problem. Sulfate does have a secondary water standard, so this technology doesn't have um, applicability in um, high concentration areas. The brown particles you see here are walnut shells. That's uh, added to fluff up the sulfate, uh, sulfur a little bit, and um, also create a habitat for other bacteria so that they can consume the carcasses of the sulfur oxidizing bacteria and maybe work on the TCE too. Um, and here's, here's what it looks like when it's um, uh, you know, covered and, and finished. And so that's uh, basically all 115 slides. Here's the Get B facility right here. This is our original ultraviolet um, treatment system for uh, NDMA. It was solar ponds back in the early days. We had enough sunlight, low enough concentrations that we could use uh, the sun to, to take care of the uh, contaminants. And then here's where our solar field is that uh, produces six megawatts of electricity out near Prairie City Road and White Rock Road. So that's it. <laughs> so if, <coughs> if you have questions, I can answer questions, and then we can, uh, we can play with the aquarium. Yeah, we spend a lot of money each year. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, 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 do, uh, uh, <coughs> we do have a, a guy that uh, focuses on that, that sulfur box. Uh, I just show the example at the end, but we have a, one of my colleagues. He, uh, he's in charge of dealing with more of the innovative things where we, we try different technologies and uh, see if it actually is going to work or whether it's just pixie dust that somebody wants to sell us. Um, because we do get people trying to sell us things that don't actually work. But um, there are a lot of interesting things that we do, plus uh, all the cool rocket stuff. Once they're in the air, you mean? Uh, well, in the, when they get into the air at, in that polishing stage, mo most of the organic molecules are destroyed either by the ultraviolet light or the peroxide. And so they're basically turned into carbon dioxide and oxygen, water, you know, and, you know, destroyed. Uh, but some of them do make it through the system and have to be polished. And, and um, we are able to release them to the air where the sun uh, would provide further destruction uh, capability, and, and then they just kind of get dispersed as well. So uh, in order to operate an air stripper, you have to get permission from you know, the, the air quality board. You have to do risk assessments to make sure that the uh, discharge is uh, compatible with the land use. In the case of Aerojet, we have a lot of open land. You know, we would never be able to use an air stripper in a community uh, setting too many residents living nearby. Well, it applies to water that we uh, that's in the ground, and we're trying to you know keep it from getting to the the supply wells. Well, I, I think what happens is we, we discovered a problem that was decades in the making, and it's, it's a really uh, time-consuming process to figure it out, to get permission, to negotiate access. And so we got started where we had access, which was our property. And so by the end of 1990, we had dealt with, you know, we, we had quickly dealt with the contaminants where we could get to them fast which was our property. So as we went into the 90s and this last 10 years, 
we started dealing with places that were farther out that had to go through all that uh, um, process, get permission, negotiate, you know, access, and, and, um, and so it just took time to get out to the front of it. Basically, by 2010, we were out at the front of the problem, and so we've had to um, put treatment on supply wells. We've had to replace supply wells. Um, we monitor supply wells on a regular basis to make sure that the uh, contaminants aren't there, and we work with the water companies in the area to ensure that uh, everybody's getting potable water. No, I drink it from the tap. Well, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was not as much sophistication or not much understanding, and so a lot of problems were created then. And so that's what we're dealing with now. Um, in the current operation, we, we don't create pollution. We uh, you know, have programs that keep the pollution from occurring and uh, you know, have audits and uh, a whole other group. There's 15 of people like me that deal with the past there's a similar number of people that deal with the present and the future to make sure that uh, that we don't, you know, lose control of things. Um, not really. I mean, they 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 don't use they, they don't use the same processes from, you know, years ago. We don't test rockets anymore. Um, that's done at other locations. Uh, so, other question? Yes. Uh, we use lots of consultants, yes. We, uh, we have our own in-house staff for things that we can do, and then we hire uh, consultants to do risk assessments to, to in, you know, investigate the data, uh, you know, investigate, collect samples. Uh, we, we hire a lot of laboratory work to analyze the samples. So yeah, we hire a lot of people uh, outside the company to facilitate our, our efforts. Uh, I can't really talk about that. A lot. <laughs> well, <coughs> we we want to be good neighbors, and so you know some of those some of those uh, vessels and you know systems are pretty ugly. You probably wouldn't want it in your in your, in your neighborhood you know, because it doesn't look very well, very good. So we, we it's, not, it's not that we're trying to c conceal them and hide them from people. We just want to put them in a, an attractive building so that people aren't, um, you know, offended by the, you know, harshness of tanks and, you know, valves and vessels like that. So just trying to be good neighbors. Go ahead. No, they're they're not loud and um, and they and they don't give off pollution. I mean, at the Ansel Hoffman Park, that that one greenish sort of building, we actually um, pump water and make it available to the park to you know irrigate. And so the water company, everybody, and that was a really great project because the water company was uh, having to deal with potential drought water so shortage issues, figuring out how to cut back on their consumption, and uh, we had water that we needed to pump, and they could use it to irrigate. So the golf course gets a good deal. The water company spends less. We, we have access to, to a place we need to pump water, and, and so it, it worked out really nice. That was a great project for, for everybody. Uh, we did. That was uh, another talk that I could do. <laughs> but yes, we, we, we took uh, nitrogen as a carrier gas and, and uh, hydrogen and basically released it from cylinders into the ground. Big, big uh, you know, huge tank of nitrogen gas, little cylinders of, uh, yeah, of hydrogen and, and basically released it into the ground at two different depths and let it you know, spread out. Um, 
um, I, I don't recall that you know acidity was a problem. Um, the the hydrogen was con was consumed by the bacteria, and plus it you know it had this tendency to you know to float to the to the top and and release. When what we what we found is when we when we looked at the hydrogen because we you know we monitored where the hydrogen was going once we released it, and so we saw the highest concentrations of hydrogen near the surface as it was trying to escape. The propane that we released, we found at the bottom of the of the of the test area, and because it's heavier than air, it had this tendency to sink. And as soon as we, you know, shut the nitrogen off, we saw the atmosphere come in and take over again. So it, that was a hard project to keep keep going. Any others? Yes. You know, it's, um, I forgot now, I think it might be aquarium technology where um, big, uh, I don't know whether marine world, what they do exactly, but it, 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 you know, this isn't like technology that, that we make up. Uh, we find it, we have our consultants, they, they're looking through the literature, they identify something and a light bulb comes on and they say, hey, this, this might work for, you know, perchlorate because it works for nitrate and, uh, and so, you know, we test it, find out that it does actually work, you know, for our application.